Summer is in full swing. The weather is perfect and the kids are outside playing. The garden is coming into peak production and today I'm inviting you along for the ride that is a homestead kitchen in the middle of summer. I have a few preservation projects plus some tips on summer snacking to share. So let's get started. My first project of the day is getting the dehydrator loaded up. During this time of year, usually it's tomatoes or cucumbers, but today I'm running a load of jerky. Now this is something that we do at home that really helps with the budget. Jerky is one of those things at the store that just seems insanely expensive. But when you consider that for every pound of jerky that they actually have in that bag, they need four pounds of meat to make it, you can kind of understand the process there. The weight is dehydrated out during the process, but that doesn't change how much they have to buy to make that happen. With that said, my guys harvest several deer every fall and we have our butcher cut it into jerky slices so we can flavor it as we wish and have it whenever we want during the season. This is one of the things that we often do during sports seasons to keep with us, to take with us to ball games and give us a nutritious snack without paying the same prices that you have in the store while keeping control of the ingredients at home. I do have a favorite cookbook that has the jerky recipe in it that I use, so I'll make sure to link that below, but it is really nice to be able to customize exactly what you want going on. Now, as you just saw there, my little helpers are down on the floor. They were making a calendar of when birthdays are coming up. My family has a birthday season with five kids. They're all reasonably close together in birthdays, so we start marking them off as we go down the road. But as you can see here, I have all of my jerky in and I'm flipping the trays to the back. I put it in with the door to my dehydrator face down so the jerky drippings were coming down on my table and then flipping them to the back just puts that jerky closer to the actual fan, which makes them dehydrate a little faster. If I was to buy a new dehydrator, I probably wouldn't buy this specific one, but a new one that they put out because it has stainless steel trays, whereas mine has the plastic ones, um, just for the ease of cleaning, I really love the newer model. So if you're interested in a dehydrator, I'll make sure to link that below. They definitely are a company with a long history of making great products. Now, as you can see here, we are out in the garden. And if you've been around for a while, you know, for the past couple weeks, I've been talking about all of my cucumbers going absolutely crazy. I love growing them on an arch trellis because they hang down underneath and it's a nice shaded spot for me to be able to harvest, but also it just keeps them up off the ground to take down the pest pressure and also to help me be able to see the larger ones that sometimes can escape view. Now, am I saying I never miss one? Of course not. We definitely still do, but that is part of it when you have a big garden. Now check out this tomato. This is the sad story of having chickens that always find their way into the garden. Until the tomatoes get up high enough to be out of their way, those little ladies will get up on my deck. They like to lay their eggs in a flower pot on my deck instead of their nice fancy laying box. Then they fly off of the deck down into the garden and go find a low hanging tomato. So as you can see here, I'm cutting some that aren't necessarily ripe, but at first blush until they're above the ladies' heads, they have to come inside to ripen on the counter. I know some people prefer ripening them and taking them at first blush anyway. I like to ripen on the vine, but that's just personal preference. Now here you can see our peppers. I grow a lot of banana peppers because my boys love pickled banana peppers for all different meals during the year, particularly as a pizza topping as well as sandwiches. But I also grew a new kind this year, which is called Giant Ancona. Um, I got those from rareseeds.com. I'll make sure to link that down below but they are really, really nice. They grew super fast, way faster than our bell peppers have even began to grow. And they are putting off the biggest, nicest peppers that the kids are eating fresh, just like they would a bell pepper. So if you're interested in growing peppers, definitely check those out. I'll be growing more of those next year and possibly fewer of our favorite bell peppers just based on how fast these others go to maturity and how quickly we can get what we want on the table and hopefully get those snacks in hands. Now, as you can see here, my tiniest assistant was out in the garden with me, but she is also really involved in the flowers. 
She loves to pick any flower that she sees out in the yard. And now that the sunflowers are in full bloom, she's all about helping me put this together. She actually had a couple jars. She ran in and shoved one of her sunflowers in a cup over on the table. So I had a little bit of a hard time trying to convince her that they should all go in the same beautiful glass up on the counter. But eventually we got there and I was showing her how to cut off the leaves that are going to be down in the water. So if you're new to floral arrangements, anytime you have greenery that's down in the water, it is just a good idea to take that off because it seems to decay a little bit sooner and cause your water to get a little bit moldy. If you take those off, they last just a little bit longer. So stripping those lower leaves and getting them in the jar. We do have some other flowers that we'll be adding in in the coming days, but they weren't out in the garden where I was at the time. So that's why we're just ending up here with the sunflowers. So far this year, I've only had to water my garden two times. It's almost on autopilot, except as you could tell when we were out there earlier, it's not weeding itself. In years past, I worked really hard to make sure it was weed free, but this year it's got away from me. I was super busy in the spring and I just didn't have time to do it. Plus with the rain coming in, it's just taking off. That said, the cucumbers are also taking off. I have enough pickles on the shelf, both dill as well as bread and butter, which are family favorites, to last us through the year. So we've turned our attention to other methods of preserving. We've given tons and tons away and they eat about 10 a day in our veggie trays, but we've also dehydrated some. And this is something that I wasn't sure about initially, but I saw a recipe for salt and vinegar cucumber chips. Now, this is something that my kids love in a potato chip form. So I thought, you know, what's the worst that can happen? We have a ton of cucumbers. They won't go to waste. So I did a run uh, a couple weeks back and they actually went really well. The one thing I'll say though, is that they don't really have a long shelf life because you are tossing them in vinegar and oil. So they're not a normal dehydrated type food that's going to last on the shelf for you for a year or so. That said, they were really good and didn't take long for the entire jar of them to be completely eaten. So that is something that I will continue to do as we move forward with a bounty of cucumbers this year. Today, after I get all of these washed up, I'm going to try a new recipe out of the ball canning cookbook, which is actually their newer version. I'll make sure to link it down below if you want to see exactly what I'm using, but it's a cucumber and red onion relish. Is supposed to be great beside fried chicken with corn on the cob or of course on a hot dog so that's what I wanted to try my kiddos aren't real big fans of relish and we might go through one total little jar a year but I thought since we had so much coming in that it was worth a try now this recipe calls for three pounds of onions but it's specific to red and my red onions out of the garden this year were pretty small the smallest of any of my onions and I grew three different varieties I had these down cooling in the basement under fans on some wired racks to make sure that they were properly drying out before putting them on the shelf. But once I came up with this recipe, I decided it was a good way to move through most of these smaller ones and get them out of the way. So the one thing I will say, we send most of our scraps to the chickens, but onion skins and the tops of onions and that kind of thing, I just throw in the trash. They're not good for chickens. So I have been considering something like one of those countertop composters or something of that sort so I can make a little compost to put on my house plants, but I haven't jumped into that yet. So if you've used one of those, let me know your thoughts down below. I've always really been interested in them, but with the chickens moving through so many of our scraps, I just really haven't moved on it, but very curious what your thoughts are. Now back to the project at hand, which is this relish. The first step is to take your onions get them cut up into about a quarter inch slices, and then you're gonna roast them off in the oven. And this is part of what gives this a really, really nice texture and taste. Now, this kitchen, I can tell you smelled amazing. The kids were coming in asking what's for dinner. They love roasted onions, but we usually do them with potatoes or something else of the sort. And today, it was just for the recipe. So they felt it was a little bit of a tease, but it really did smell fabulous. So once all of these were on the trays, I put them in the broiler and broiled them until they started to char on the, on the top and then flipped them over 
and let them go until they charred on the opposite side as well. Now I turned on my low broil and I think it would have been better if I turned on the high. The instructions did say five minutes per side, but I found mine took a little bit longer. So make sure that you just keep your eyes on it. Don't let it go too far, of course. You don't want anything burnt in there, but you definitely want to get them black so you can get the texture and the uh, flavor that you're looking for. Now the next order of business is to weigh out your cucumbers. You need two pounds of cucumbers and make sure you're not taking the ones that are so big that they're really seedy inside. The seeds will impact the texture and that's not quite what you're going for. With my cucumbers weighed out, I took the rest of what we brought in today and went ahead and put it in the refrigerator. We actually have an entire crisper drawer dedicated to the day's cucumber harvest, if you can believe that. I do make sure before they go in the refrigerator that I give them a good wash and I always take a washcloth and rub against the grain to remove any of the little spikes that are on the outside. I definitely don't want the kids reaching in to grab a cucumber and coming away injured. And if you did notice when I was outside, I made sure to wear gloves when cutting my cucumbers. I have two different kinds out on the vine. The one that is the most prolific right now is called Monica and it is really, really spiky. So I wanna make sure that when I'm using those or if I'm suggesting them to you, that you know gloves are gonna be something that you definitely wanna have around. This will prevent those annoying little spikes from sticking into your hands. Now, once those are all put away, I moved on to cutting up my cucumbers for this relish. Now, per the directions, it's looking for a very small dice on the cucumber. The recipe does not call for shredding the cucumbers like a traditional hot dog relish that you might pick up at the store. I did consider altering this just for ease of the process by running it through my food processor, but I decided just to move forward and see exactly what I thought about how I follow the recipe this time. In the future, just depending on final texture, I might alter that, but I did really like the way this looked and at first taste came out really nice. So I'll just have to pull the audience once we have our first hot dogs after this and see exactly what they think. You are supposed to have about six total cups of cut up cucumber when you get done. So I wanted to make sure and measure it out. Even though I had weighed it, I wanted to make sure that I didn't take out too many seeds or need to add another one since I obviously have enough in there. But once I got them in my measuring cup, I did have right at six. And as you'll see in a minute, my second set of eyes came in just to double check me. She thought it was a little low, but when she gave it a look, she decided that I was right on track once you got them all shaken out. With all of the prep complete, I'm turning my attention over to the stove to get the brine mixed up. Now this one comes in with sugar, vinegar, and lime juice instead of lemon, which some canning recipes will use to balance the acidity. But the lime juice is really a nice change of flavor in this recipe, and we, we really were pleased with the way it turned out. Now if you take a look just beyond where I set that sugar jar down, you'll see my cookbook is propped up over there by the stove. This is the all new ball book of canning and preserving, and that's where the recipe comes from specifically. But also I wanted to point out that that is a spiral bound edition. If you have the opportunity to pick up a spiral, I definitely recommend it over the traditional binding because I find that all of the spiral cookbooks that I have lay open so much nicer. And when I'm in the middle of a canning project, I find that the extra expense is totally worth it not to have to worry about the pages flipping over. Another thing I want to point out is this measuring cup. This thing saves me so much time when I'm going back and forth between one cup, a cup and a half, or two cups because I can just adjust the level over on the side and it has different markings whether you're using a liquid or a solid ingredient. That really helps to make sure that you're not going to end up with a ton of dirty dishes when this is over. I also try to just use a tablespoon and a teaspoon most often most normally, but in a canning recipe, if there is a half or a specific measurement, I do always follow the exact canning recipe to make sure that you're gonna end up with a safe recipe in the end. The recipe also calls for kosher salt, which is what you saw me pouring out of my salt grinder. Over on the side of my salt crock, I just have the regular table salt, and so I wanted to make sure to have the appropriate salt. So for anybody wondering exactly what I was doing, I was just making sure to get the right size granule because if you go with a traditional table salt when it's calling for kosher, the recipe will end up saltier than you want simply based on the size of the crystal. With all of the ingredients in the brine, I let it set over on the stove because it needed to come up to a boil. Meantime, pulling those roasted caramelized onions out of the oven and then you let them cool until they're cool enough to touch per the recipe. 
It says to go ahead and cut them up by hand, but I decided this was the perfect place for the food processor. I didn't want to cut up a bunch of warm onions, so I threw them in and pulsed them a few times, and they came out perfect. This is a relatively new food processor for me because my old KitchenAid broke, so I had to find a new one, and I was amazed with how well this did on the pulsing job. So definitely something to consider if you're looking for ways to make food processing easier when you have larger batches to handle. This is totally not sponsored, of course, just giving you my honest feedback. I feel like the Cuisinart does a better job of cutting up and especially pulsing than the KitchenAid. And I saw that when I was looking at comparative reviews online before I made this purchase. And I really have to say, I do, I do think they were right. I think it does a better job. Now that I have the final ingredients ready to go, and the brine has come up to a boil. It's time to go ahead and add the cucumbers and the onions into the mix. Now, one thing I will tell you is that I was not expecting for this to turn out so red in the end. My kiddos actually came over and asked if I was making salsa once I got done. So I was surprised by how much of the red color from those onions ended up coming off on the cucumbers. And you will see that here momentarily. But once you get it all in and stirred up, you can see it's already starting to really come together right there. But you cook it down for 10 minutes until it all incorporates. And once that happens, you use a slotted spoon specifically to spoon it off into your jars. Now these are clean. I went through all the steps to make sure that they were safe, but I didn't want to take the time to give you all of those directions again. I've got plenty of videos on canning basics if you're interested in that. But getting them all into the four jars here, the recipe did say that it made five. I can tell you, I never come out with the right amount, even following the recipe to a T using weights and checking the measuring. So if you can get five out of this, great. I got four. I do think it's a good option to perhaps move into half pint jars. I just wasn't sure if I would be able to get 10 of them into my canner. So I decided to go with the full pints like the recipe suggests, just to make sure that I could run one load and get them all complete. Once you get everything in there, you have to adjust the headspace to a half inch and debubble and make sure that you get it right up to that half inch line, which is what you can see me doing here. Once that's accomplished, you want to go ahead and get your rims really clean. I'm using a vinegar to make sure that there's no interference with the lid sticking and then getting them into the pot once the lids are on and the rings are sealed. I had this water simmering in the back for a while, so it is not boiling, but it definitely is warm and steamy as you can see there. Once I got all of the jars into the water, I could see that the water level wasn't quite what I wanted because I was planning on having five jars. So what I did was I went over and got hot water and put it into the jar. The reason I wanted hot is because I didn't want there to be any thermal shock. And once the processing was complete, I took off the lid let it set for five minutes, and you can see that the first jar I pull out here is actually canned water. I do this anytime I need to raise the water level. One, it puts something on the shelf that can be beneficial to us if there is a problem with our city water or they need to put us under a boil order or something of that sort, which has happened. But to have the water available and canned just by using up the free space in the canner not only raises the water level, but also gives a little more insurance. One more pint of water on the shelf can't hurt. With the jars out and cooling for the next 12 to 24 hours, we headed back into the pantry to pull out the jerky. Now, my little guy wanted to pull it out himself because he is the one that actually mixed up the marinade. He's the, the jerky man at our house, so he's pulling it out and putting it in jars. We did leave the lids off to let them cool down and make sure that there wasn't any humidity in there. And over the next coming days, we'll check to make sure that they got the desired amount of doneness, or that is, I should say, if it lasts that long, because it'll go really fast around my house. With that said, I want to thank you for stopping by the Hometown Homestead. Join me next week as we cover a week of summer meals and classics that we love around our house not only are delicious with fresh ingredients straight out of the garden but will also save you money thanks again for stopping by friends and we'll see you back soon